questions that they ask good questions. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's not the same people. And not the same people. It's like a stage band. There's a reality show too. Oh, wow. And it's not the same that It's not the person. 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 It's not the actually being graded. Um, homework one is almost ready to hand back. So my goal is to get that back to you this week, then the week after spring break to get homework two back to you, and then the week after that, after you've gotten some feedback on your writing style, I'll give you the bit. All right. So um, where we were last time is just as a kind of, uh, just as a very, I think, pleasant and surprising um, and complete problem is telling whether a certain integral is zero or not. I just think it's marvelous that, you know, so completely divorced from the discrete world of colorings and subsets and Boolean formulae in the continuous world of calculus, we again have NP completeness. So part of my goal here is to get across the ideology that uh, complexity in general and NP-completeness in particular are really very ubiquitous. They show up in many, many uh, different settings. So let's call this problem cosine integral. And the input is a set of integers. And the question is, is the following integral cosine of x1 theta times cosine of x2 theta dot 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 cosine of xn theta? Is it non zero? <coughs> now, is this problem even in NP? In general, if I hand you an integral, you know, so some symbolic integral, is the problem of whether it's non-zero, is that problem in NP? I mean, how much are we functions? Yeah, let's invent a little problem and call it symbolic integration, okay? 
This is the problem which packages like Mathematica and MATLAB often try to solve. Uh, let's focus on the decision problem of whether it's zero or not. So I will give you a certain basic alphabet, left parentheses and right parentheses, plus, minus, times, divide. I'll give you a couple of functions to play with, cosine, e to the x, sine, tangent, some reasonable things. And then I'll ask you, uh, you know, I'll, I'll hand, you can use the symbol pi for the constant pi. You can use the symbol e. I'll give you these basic things that we think of as being, you know, elementary closed form functions from calculus. And then I ask you, is the integral from here to here non-zero? Is that problem in NP? Yeah. Why not? Because it's continuous. Maybe there's a better reason than it's continuous. I mean, mm -hmm. what would it mean for that problem to be in NP? You'd, be, you'd have to be able to easily check it. Yeah. Yeah, there has to be some sort of witness that you can show me mm -hmm. that proves that it's non-zero. Yeah. And I don't know what that would be. I'm not saying there isn't one. I'm just saying I don't see one. I mean, giving me a sample of the function at a couple of different values is not quite enough. I mean, it's true that in some cases you could really prove some inequality, like from here to here it's positive and it's at least 10. And from here to here it's negative but not too negative. And look at the width of this interval and look at the width of this interval and blah, blah, blah. I can imagine things like that. But I don't see that something like that would work in every case, yeah. especially if the integral oscillated wildly. And this one oscillates wildly. Okay. I mean, yeah. Sorry. in that case, it's necessary. I mean, no matter how fine green the I mean, approximation, the discrete you make, so it's kind of continuous, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of, the, part of the problem is that without thinking pretty carefully about the nature of numerical integration, it's not obvious how many sample points you need. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind that these integers here have n digits. So these integers can be exponentially big. Now, so what is the function cosine x theta? What does it do between 0 and 2 pi? Well, cosine of 1 times theta looks like this. But cosine of 10 times theta does this 10 times. And these things can be exponentially big. So this can, each term in this product can wiggle back and forth an exponential number of times. So it's a very rapidly oscillating integral. Um, although it's, you know, because the x's have n digits, roughly speaking, because there are only n of them, well, it doesn't actually take you that long to type this into your favorite numerical integration routine and see what it does, see if it breaks it. Well, it turns out that this particular type of integral, and this is where some of the cuteness will come in, telling whether it's non-zero is in NP, and in fact is NP complete. So that's what we'll do. And we'll use, <coughs> we'll use this fact, which everyone should know. Did you know that? You probably knew it in high school and then forgot. So you really must know this. And of course, this is just because e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Okay. And here's the complex plane. The x coordinate or the real part is cosine theta. The y coordinate or the imaginary part is sine theta. And I forget, was it Euler? So many people think that, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Euler has this written on his tombstone. I mean, what a beautiful equation, you know. 0, 1, e, i, and pi, all wrapped up in one little box. All right. So what happens if we plug this in here? So maybe you can start to see where this is going. I'm going to get e to the ix1 theta plus e to the minus ix1 
theta. Let's pull all these twos out in front, so I'll put 1 over 2 to the n out there. And then I have e to the ix2 theta plus e to the minus ix2 theta, and so on. Okay. What happens when I multiply all these things together and expand out the sum? What kind of things do I see in each term? You're going to have terms that involve all the x's, right? I'm going to have terms that involve all the x's. Can you say a little more? So the very first term will be e to the i x1 plus x2 plus dot, 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 up to xn theta. And give me another term. It'll be... How many terms are there? Two to the n, yes. There will be two to the n cross terms because in each one I get to choose the left-hand side or the right-hand side here. So then what does a typical one of these things look like? One of these terms is minus i x1. Oh, minus, yeah. There's different terms with positive and negative. Just. Right, so what I'm going to get is the two to the n combinations of whether I have a plus or a minus in front of x to the n, in front of xn, xi, for all i ranging from 1 to n. Everybody still with us? Good. So the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. So what happens when I integrate a particular one of these terms? Remember, the x's are integers, so each one of these sums, or signed sums, where each term can be, have a plus or a minus in front of it, is also an integer. So if L is an integer, what happens if I integrate e to the i L theta from 0 to 2 pi? Perhaps someone from Los Alamos? <laughs> Just because you're up there on the hill doesn't mean you get out of answering questions. <coughs> Remember, computer science and electrical engineering were the same department only, you know, a decade or two ago. So you shouldn't have fallen so far from the tree. <laughs> yes. Well, it's zero, isn't it? I'm yes, kidding. it's zero unless what? Unless. I mean, you take this thing in the complex plane. It goes around l times in the course of theta going from zero to two pi. These all, it all cancels out and gives you zero unless, unless L is less than one. L is an integer. Oh, integer. Not the decimal. And so, or something, or, or none. Well, if L is an integer. If it's odd. If it's uh, actually, no, even if it's odd, because we're going all the way around by 2 pi. I hope. So, um, If you go around once, everything cancels. If you go around twice, everything cancels. Zero. If L is zero, then what is this the integral of? One. One. Oh, I see. And so it's two pi if L is zero. And it's zero if L isn't zero. Okay. So what that means is that when I take the integral, it kills off every term here except the terms where what? Equal numbers of plus and minus. 
Uh, not just equal numbers of plus oh, and minus. Yeah, but they are the same. It's kind of neat. So These so x's are all integers, off. right? Exactly. exactly. It, it, it looks like some version of subset sum or integer partitioning. Yeah. Because what matters is that the sum here has to equal 0. And some of these have a plus and some of them have a minus. So if we put all the pluses on one side and all the minuses on the other, then they have to be balanced. So, you know, do I need to write that out in some formal way? I mean, the point is, you know, if x1 minus x2 plus x3 plus x4 minus x5 is 0, it's the same as saying that x1 plus x3 plus x4 equals x2 plus x5, and that's an integer partitioning problem. Isn't that cute? So if you had a, if you had a magical integration routine, which could do this integral in polynomial time, then you could solve the integer partitioning problem, which means you could solve subset sum, which means you could solve 1 in 3 sat, which means you could solve 3 coloring, which means you could solve 3 sat, which means you could solve circuit sat, and therefore witness existence, and therefore any problem in NP. Okay? which means that unless p equals np, this circuit is exponentially hard to evaluate. It takes exponential time to evaluate. I think that if you throw this at Mathematica, it does actually expand it out, and there will be two to the n terms. I think Mathematica knows this, but it will, you know, so it'll, it'll get it, but it will take exponential time because it will actually look at all two to the n terms. But if there's some more magical way to avoid all this work of multiplying this thing out to something exponentially long and checking the exponent, the sum of plus x's and minus x's in each one, then p equals np. Any questions about this? You probably thought you didn't have to know this, but you do. You really do. And of course, if you're going to do any sort of signal processing, you know, I mean, if you think that the Fourier transform is about sines and cosines, well, you're still living in sin. It's about e to the i thetas. That's the right way to view the Fourier transform. You know, I shudder to think what will happen to your immortal soul if you think of it as sines and cosines. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? I'm not even Catholic, but you know this the whole picture of you know sin and redemption it's it's very poetic. It's good for teaching mathematics. All right, so um there's one problem which we started out with. Let's go back now and prove that it is NP complete. Okay, so let's come full circle. Since from the beginning of the course, we've used Hamiltonian path as our illustration of a problem which seems to be hard. So let's really show that it's <coughs> incomplete. Um, and here, I mean, this is the one that I copied right out of Sipser's. There's nothing original about our treatment of this particular problem. You can find it in Sipser just as well. Um, I'm going to start with the directed version. Okay, so Hamiltonian path on a directed graph. Well, the edges of arrows, you need to visit everybody by going, by moving along the arrows. And I'm going to reduce from, so I usually draw this the other way, but I'm going to reduce to Hamiltonian path from 3 sat and thus prove that Hamiltonian path is NP complete. So we're going to start out with choice gadgets. 
So again, I need something that corresponds to a Boolean choice, setting a variable true or false. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, here's going to be my initial point, S. This is going to be a Hamiltonian path, not a Hamiltonian circuit. We could easily make it a circuit by adding one more edge that leads from the end back to the beginning. Um, so here's my choice gadget. I'll just draw it, and hopefully you'll see what's going on. You have to visit every vertex. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to go one way or the other, yeah. right? I mean, so if you go here, then you have to go through this chain left to right, right? You, you have to visit each one exactly once. You're not allowed to retrace your steps. <coughs> so once you start moving from left to right, you're committed. So there's two ways to do this, this way and this way. So let's call those, let's call the left to right way setting some variable x true. And let's call the other way setting x false. Okay. And if we have a bunch of variables, we'll just string a bunch of these things together. All right, so those are our choice gadgets. Now we need a constraint gadget. Well, the constraint gadget is kind of embarrassingly simple. So what we want now, let's say this is x and this is y. Let's say that I have a clause, since I only had space to draw two variables. Maybe this clause is x or not y. I could easily make it a three variable clause. Well, Hamiltonian path is all about you have to visit every vertex. So my constraint gadget is going to be a vertex. And here's how I'm going to wire it up. I want to make it possible for you to make a brief detour away from the choice gadgets and come visit this clause gadget, this constraint gadget, but only if one of these two things are true. So here's what I'll do. I will take one of these right moving edges that's part of the path on which we chose to set x true. I'm going to break it. And instead of going directly from here to here, I'll let you go. Uh, I, actually, you, you can still go from here to here directly. But in addition, you can get from here to here by visiting this clause gadget and then coming back. Similarly, on the paths moving leftward for y, where y is false, I will allow you to optionally go from here to here by first going here and then there. You see the idea? Okay. So the point is that if you have chosen to set x to be true, then you can, in the course of going through this gadget, you can visit that vertex and cover it. You don't have to. You can go directly through. For that matter, you can set x to the other value. But then if you set y to be false in this case, you can choose to go through this gadget with this detour. But if you chose to set y true, there's no way that you can visit this on the way from here to here because, you know, the edge comes from here but returns to there. So you can only do that detour if you're moving in this direction. I'm just, just, just wondering why. I mean, you know, let's say that x is true and y is false. Let's say that you, 
you choose to do this and this. Um, well, you don't need to, de to, de to do the detour on both of them. In fact, you're only allowed to visit this vertex once. But what matters is that you can do it on one of them. But what if both of them are true? I mean, is it, is it twice? You, well, you're not allowed to visit twice. Um, yeah, so, but that's a valid, I mean, that's a reason, right? Well, but remember, you know, what's a satisfying assignment? I mean, uh, a satisfying assignment is just one where at least one of these things in the clause is true. Yeah, exactly. So you get to choose which one you're going to use. But it seems like it's exactly one, isn't it? You're only going to actually do the detour on one of them. But you could have done the detour on any of the variables that make this clause happy. Exactly. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, that's why I'm keeping this edge here. Okay. I said before I broke this edge and then I took it back. We're not going to break this edge. We keep this edge in place. <clears throat> okay. So, I mean, in this case, there are two different paths that would work. Mm -hmm. right. I, well, actually, there are many paths. But even if x is true and y is false, you could do the detour on the x leg of your journey or on the y leg of your journey. But the only way that one of those is possible is if with your choice gadgets you've made choices that satisfy the clause. So if I have more clauses, then I'll just have more of these clause vertices that are wired in in the analogous way. And you might ask, you know, why, why did I make this five vertices wide? Well, that was totally arbitrary. I only, made, I only did that for illustration because the point is, what if x appears in two different clauses? There's another clause over here, x or w or not z or something, where w and z are more variables that we have lower down. Well, then I also want to be able to do a detour if I'm moving from left to right here to this clause. So I'm just going to make these wide enough so that I can use the fact that x is true in as many of the clauses it appears in that I want. So if it appears in k clauses, I'll make this k wide. So we could do a formal proof, but do we have to? I mean, do you see at least that if there's a satisfying assignment for the three set formula, then there is a Hamiltonian path from S to whatever T is at the bottom of all these variable gadgets. Well, strictly speaking, we need to prove the converse. To prove the converse, we just need to prove that the gadgets work. You know, the question is, well, okay, you claim you have a Hamiltonian path. Well, you must have visited here somehow. How did you get there? Well, you must have taken a detour when you were passing through one of the, one of the choice gadgets. And the only way you could have done that is if you were passing through it in the direction that this clause likes. If you were either passing through x in the true direction or through y in the false direction. Questions about this? So, if you want to do an and of two clauses, it's kind of implicit since any vertex you add, you have to visit. It's implicit, yes. Okay. So, the point is that, you know, however many clauses we have in our formula, we have a vertex for each one. And by the definition of the Hamiltonian path, you have to find a way to visit this one and visit this one and visit this one. And that means you have to satisfy all the clauses. So yeah, the and is sort of built right into the definition of the Hamiltonian path. And if you want to make it a cycle, just add an edge from S all the way back to T. I mean, from T all the way back to S. Oh, yeah.
So I claim that we have proved that the directed version of Hamiltonian path is NP-complete. Are you happy? Is this convincing? You could explain it to a friend on a napkin over your favorite beverage with enough of your favorite beverage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I hope this is clear. If it isn't clear, email me or come to office hours or something, or raise your hand now or on Thursday or something. This needs to be clear because, um, you know, the concept of NP completeness needs to be clear. And so, I mean, how, how one invented this, well, this is, this is clever, right? I think actually Sipser came up with this in the context of writing his book. If you look at older books, there's a nastier looking reduction. And I think he just came up with a nicer choice gadget and realized there was a simple way to wire this choice gadget into the constraint gadget, and that's where the clever doodling comes in. So, all right, any questions? So let's get rid of this undirected version. So, I mean, rewriting this over here, We've shown, we've shown how to reduce 3SAT to directed Hamiltonian path. Let's reduce that to the original version, which was defined on an undirected graph. Well, this isn't too hard. But it's sort of a nice exercise, because we have to figure out how to, how to represent directed edges, edges with arrows, with undirected edges. So if you um, thought about the exercise I gave a couple days ago proving that NAE sat is NP complete by reducing 3 sat to it, there was a similar problem. You sort of, if you read that part of the book, you know that you kind of have to choose a direction and then relative to that direction, you can make everything work. So in the same way here, how do, I, how do I simulate an edge with an arrow on it? Well, I'm not really, but suppose that I had something that looked like this. Well, in order to visit these two vertices, I either have to enter on this side and exit on that side, or I have to do the reverse. So that's kind of the idea. I can't. I can't cheat by sort of going halfway and then going doubling back and then visiting the other vertex at the other end in some other way. In fact, this is true even with a single vertex in the center. Right? If I don't have a vertex on the edge, I could visit both endpoints by doing this. But if I have a vertex there, then I really need to cross it one way or the other. So that's basically the idea. So um, let's simulate a vertex which has some incoming edges and some outgoing edges. What we need to prevent, so we're, doing, we're going to do an undirected simulation of a directed graph. What kind of cheating do we need to prevent? Probably just uh, uh, one edge. Uh, one vertex in the middle of each page. Yes, but that's the answer. Well, what's the question? I mean, wh what do I need to make sure doesn't happen? I'm, I'm going to, I mean, for instance, what could go wrong if I just erased the arrows? Just, you can go, the order can, can be different. You can go only to this edge from three vertices, but in this case, for example, we can go to it from four. Yeah, you can go back. Yeah, the problem is that I could come in along this edge and leave along that one, but that would violate my directed path, right? Right. I mean, in a directed Hamiltonian path, I'm not allowed to come in on to go with the arrow on one step and against the arrow on another step. So instead, what I'm going to do um, is. I mean, notice it would be okay to go against the arrows on every step. That would be okay because then just do it all backwards. Mm -hmm. 
Okay? So with the arrows on every step is okay. Against the arrows on every step is okay. You just don't want to switch back and forth. So as you said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to expand this vertex into a little gadget consisting of three vertices. We're going to attach the incoming edges to, to this one and the outgoing edges to that one. Well, now the point is, if you, you, can cut, you can visit here coming in along any of these three. But if you come in along this edge, well, you have to visit this vertex. So now the only way to do that is to go here. But now the only way you, the only way you can go is here. And now you have to exit along one of those. Okay, so this, this forces us that if we come in along an arrow, we have to leave along an outgoing arrow. So we can, so this reduction is very simple. We just replace every vertex with three like this and wire them up in this way. And then I claim that there's an undirected Hamiltonian path on this thing, if and only if there's a directed Hamiltonian path on this thing. Okay. And now we've proved that undirected Hamiltonian path is NP. Yes, that proof wasn't as convincing. Wasn't as convincing? Yeah. Okay. Because it seems like you could have had a cycle that goes up, back around here, and then go down. Uh, but I have to visit this one somehow. So I agree if it were just a Hamiltonian path, maybe I could cheat by making this the very last place I visit that I don't go through. We have two of them. That could be a problem, but maybe so if we're talking about cycles and cycles. And well, if you're going to visit this, the fact is you're going to cross both these edges at some point, either going in this direction or going in that direction. Does that help? Okay. <clears throat> I hope everyone else is also, is also convinced. Your, your obligation as a citizen is either to be convinced or to object. So if you don't object, all right. <clears throat> OK, good. So um, so what should we talk about next in our remaining hour and 20 minutes before spring break? <laughs> <laughs> So many things we could talk about. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about why why is the P versus NP question so hard? Um, I've talked about this a little bit in the initial blather at the beginning of the course. But, but the question is, you know, we have this very strong intuition, at least I hope you do by now, that a lot of problems like 3SAT or graph coloring, that you're basically searching for a needle in an exponentially large ha haystack. Right? That here's the, here's the haystack. So I mean, this is the set of all 2 to the n possible truth assignments for your variables, or all 3 to the n possible colorings of the vertices of your graph with three colors. And you want to know whether anywhere in here there's a needle, and you know whether there is a proper coloring or a satisfying assignment. And this needle in a haystack metaphor is pretty good because if you look at a particular truth assignment or a particular coloring, it's very easy to check to see if it works. And similarly, if you look at a particular little bit of hay from the haystack, you can look at it and tell whether it's a needle. But it still seems hard to just instantly tell whether there is one in here, right? So 
if we have to do brute force, there's an exponential number of bits of hay to look at. It's going to take us exponential time. The problems in P are somehow the ones where there's some magical method that, you know, cuts the haystack in two and says, it's in that half, and cuts that haystack in two and says, oh, it's in that half. And within a polynomial number of steps, you find the needle, or you learn that there aren't any. Okay. Um, or it's like you have a big magnet that you can hold up above the whole thing, and the needle goes click. But for a lot of problems, and in particular for NP-complete problems, it feels as if there's no such thing. And it feels as if, roughly speaking, you have to search, and there's no way around it. But why can't we prove that? Does that sound so utterly impossible to prove that there's no way to do this? So, um, so I want to talk between now and Thursday about why this is so hard to prove, and also what would be at stake if P and NP were the same. So um, first, let's talk about what if P equals NP. OK? So of course, you're probably thinking, oh, you know, what a, what a convenient world it would be if P and NP were the same. I could tile my bathroom really easily and quickly. I, I could find uh, very efficient flights and train schedules. I could pack my luggage in the back of my car. That would be great. But, but why would you even want to do any of those things? Because if P and NP are the same, well, OK, pack your luggage, go to the beach, because human intelligence is not required to do any of the things we like to think it's required to do. So in particular, I'm out of a job. Um, well, I guess I could teach you. But what would be the point? Why would you want to learn? <laughs> so so if, if P and NP are the same, then uh, in particular, uh, so uh, there's a lovely letter from the logician Kurt Gödel to the let's honor our profession and call him a computer scientist, John von Neumann, um, even though he was many, many things. Um, uh, John von Neumann was very sick. Kurt wrote him this letter in the hospital. So, and this was in the 1950s. This was before the notion of P and NP and NP completeness was invented. Uh, the idea of NP completeness basically was invented um, in parallel in Russia and the United States in uh, 1971, 1972. So this is before then. So um, Kurt Gödel was interested in the following thing. Uh, you know, he was a logician, so he phrased, uh, he phrased it in a slightly abstract way. So suppose a mathematical statement that we care about has a proof written in your favorite logical for formal language for proving things of length n. So let phi of n be the time it takes an optimal machine. He was thinking about Turing machines, but you know I'm happy if you just want to think about programs or algorithms to find the proof. Okay. So let me point out that um, if your logical language has, let's say, 50 symbols, uh, you know, A through Z, uh, left parentheses and right parentheses, ands, ors, for alls, there exists, all of that stuff, then there are 50 to the n different strings of symbols of length n. Well, let's be generous and say there are 50 to the n potential proofs of length n. Of course, most of these strings are totally gibberish, but a lot of them are at least grammatical. But maybe they're wrong, or maybe they prove something else, or maybe they prove the opposite, or whatever. OK? So uh, let's say that. Um, so let's take your favorite unsolved mathematical problem. 
Uh, let's take one of these seven problems that the Clay Mathematical Institute has offered a million dollars for. So if you solve any of these problems, you'll get uh, fame and immortality and a mere million dollars. So some of these problems are the Riemann hypothesis, which actually has been proved by a guy who doesn't want the prize. Um, no, I'm sorry. Bah! The Poincaré conjecture has been proved by a guy who lives with his mom and doesn't want the prize. The Poincaré conjecture says that high dimensional things which look like spheres are spheres. The Riemann hypothesis is a hypothesis about the distribution of the prime numbers and has many consequences all over mathematics. Um, there's the, uh, there's proving that the Navier-Stokes equation, which describes hydrodynamics, actually has solutions. This is pretty hard because it describes turbulence, and turbulence is hard to get a grip on. There's a couple of other things, something called the Hodge conjecture. I don't know what that's about. And then there's P versus NP. Yeah. So all right. anyway, this is, this is the most interesting, of course. So, um, so let's say that you're going to guess that the Riemann hypothesis has a proof with less than a million symbols written in some formal mathematical language. OK? Maybe the shortest proof is a lot bigger. But you know, if the shortest proof is a trillion symbols long, none of your human competitors are going to find it either. And you know, so let's assume that it has a short, elegant proof that we just haven't been clever enough to find. All right, well, there are roughly 50 to the million potential proofs, which is a lot. And that's an exponentially large haystack. But in his letter to von Neumann, Gödel said, you know, what if phi of n isn't exponential? What if phi of n is, you know, he said n squared, for instance. So let's rephrase this in more modern terms. So let's invent two problems. Proof checking is a statement S and a long string of statements called P, which I claim is a proof. And the question is, is, is P a valid proof of S? What, what complexity class do you think this problem is in? I hand you a proof and I ask, is this, are the steps in this proof correct? And do they prove S? And keep in mind, it's, it's written in one of these nice formal languages where each thing is supposed to follow from the previous one by a standard set of axioms. Just check all of them. And yeah, just, yeah, so how long, it, what complexity class is this problem in? Uh, in P, you can um, check. Was that in P or NP? N. N. Big N. P. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, you can stick to your guns. You said we can just check every line. How long does that take? Um, yeah, but polynomial, but it's just like checking, is, but not finding. Exactly, not finding. Right? So this is like, here's a graph, here's a coloring. Is this coloring valid? Or here's a formula, here's a truth assignment. Does this satisfy all the clauses? Well, that problem is in P. In P, right? So this is the checking problem. Checking a proof, I mean, I know that checking a proof for us is not always easy. But the whole point of formal mathematics is that it makes proofs easy to check. You know, that it's a completely unequivocal question does this line follow from line 42 and line 17 using, using axiom 3? Yes or no? And if yes, you move on. So um, checking proofs is easy. 
So now proof finding. <clears throat> so input s and an integer, and I'm again going to play this trick that n is given in unary. Because I want the thing that we're trying to find, which is the proof, to have a size which is polynomial as a function of the size of this input. So I don't want to give n in binary because then n could be exponentially big. And the question is, is there a proof p of length less than or equal to n? Well, that's the decision problem. Of course, I'd actually like to have the proof. But for that, at the moment, let's just ask yes or no, is there a proof? Well, if you believe that this is in P, well, this is in NP. Okay. So in modern terms, Gödel is asking, what if this problem is in P? What if you can find proofs of length n, or tell if there are any proofs of length n, or up to n, in time which is only polynomial in n, instead of the exponential you would get if you had to do some kind of search? Okay. So Gödel says something like, and it's quoted precisely in the book, um, then uh, something like human ingenuity would no longer be necessary uh, to do mathematics. Because again, if there isn't a proof of a million or let's be generous and make it a billion, symbols, then no human will ever find it anyway. But if that problem can be solved in only, say, a million squared steps on a computer, I mean, that's nothing. That's only a trillion. You know, your computer does a trillion things every day. Maybe a little things. But. So, um, uh, right. I mean, of course, this is a very loaded phrase here. Right? So what, what, is this, what does human ingenuity mean? Well, the point is that when we think about mathematics and we try to find proofs of things, we don't sit around looking through the haystack saying, hmm, oh, no, that doesn't make sense. Hmm, no, that doesn't make sense. We use all our creativity and all our intuition to say, wait a second, this problem is a little bit like that one, and let's use this metaphor and this analogy. And, and we try to zoom in on the right place in the haystack. And of course, we often fail. But this is what we try to do. And we pride ourselves on, we like to believe we're pretty good at this. And at the moment, we're much better than any of our computers at this. Um, we're slower but we're much better at selecting which part of this search space to search in. Um, so uh, anyway, so if this were true, as you can imagine, this is a pretty fundamental problem. And not only is it in NP, but I claim it's NP complete. So in his letter, Goodall actually said that he thought this wasn't so unbelievable. He thought, well, oh, maybe something clever with the prime numbers or something. But you know, he was getting old. I think this is totally unbelievable, because I, I, I can't stand to think this. Um, so if p equals np, then we can find proofs in time which grows only polynomially as a function of the length of the proof. So it's important to realize this because um, you know, it's not just about, oh, now we can have more efficient routes for our traveling salesmen. And you know, now we can design our chips better and get a better chip layout. I mean, it's not just little practical things like that. 
the sky would fall. Lions and lambs would lie down together. Giants would walk the earth. So uh, it would be a very, very big deal if P and NP were the, were the same. You know, let me write down another problem, although it's not going to be quite as well defined as this one. Here's a problem. <laughs> Let's call this empirical science. Input some data. Output the most, uh, well, let's say, I, I, I'm going to stretch a little bit and say the most elegant, because I'm trained as a physicist, but um, theory which explains this data. And maybe predicts it uh, within some error epsilon. So for instance, you're an astronomer, and you're looking at the position of Mars in the sky. And it does this really crazy thing. It goes backwards, and then it goes around again, and then does these funny figure eights in the sky. And your Ptolemy, uh, around, what, 50 AD, I forget. And you say, hey, we and Mars are both going around the sun. That's why it does this funny backwards thing. And then a couple of hundred years later, 1,400 years later, um, you're Kepler and you say, oh wait, I can, get, I can get epsilon down much farther. I can get really close to the data by saying, hey, these are elliptical orbits. Which was an incredible achievement, right? To be sitting here and just look, be looking at tables of astronomical data and realize that the orbits are elliptical. I mean, that's an incredible achievement. So, um, but, we don't need this nice human intuition. If p equals np, I claim that this problem is kind of in np, right? If to believe my claim is the same as believing that if I have a theory, you can check to see whether it does explain d. Well, this is not always true, right? So for instance, string theory is famous for us not being able to figure out what its consequences and predictions are. Okay. But for most of science, you know, you put forward a theory and it's clear what the consequences of that theory are. It's clear what predictions it makes. And then you can easily check to see if those are close to the data. So again, if you can check theories, you can find them. So if P equals NP, then anything we can check, we can find. All right? But you can't take this the most elegant theory. Oh, most elegant, well, I, I guess we have to be able to check that too. It could be simply the shortest written in some scientific language. I, I actually think our notions of elegance are not probably not too hard to capture, but Let's say, if you object to that, I'll back off a little bit and say, shortest. <laughs> okay, that we can check. Once we decide what language we're talking in. I mean, I'm, I'm being deliberately informal. I'm not sure how useful it would be to nail down all the terms here precisely. But what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, this whole experience that we have cognitively is you know, these eureka moments, right? What happens in a eureka moment is something comes to you which seems beforehand very hard to see, very hard to imagine. And then after you see it, it's instantly obvious in retrospect, right? It's like, oh, well, that's the right explanation. So certainly there's a strong sense in the moment that, yes, you can see that it's correct. Well, that means that checking it is in P. So finding it is in NP, but if P equals NP, then finding it, finding it is in P as well. Okay. So um, now, by the way, this is not one of these silly Penrose-style rants against artificial intelligence. Um, I, I'm sure that there can be artificial intelligence because I think that, you know, I believe I'm a material object and, uh, you know, with 
I mean, a really, really wonderful material object, but it's still a material object. And so I'm sure that we can build computers uh, or maybe grow them, I'm not sure how it will work, that can think and do mathematics and science and lots of other things. But I think that they'll be faced with the same problems that we are, right? They will also have to struggle to make analogies and metaphors and be intuitive and creative. And just like we get stuck, they'll get stuck. Um, and what I don't believe is that there's some simple polynomial time algorithm where you can just turn the crank and get the answer in every case. Okay. So another way to put this is, if this is true, if, if these problems are in P, then it means that there's one method which always works efficiently. But that's not how we feel when we solve problems. We feel like every problem we see, you know, yes, you, you, you struggle to see how it's similar to problems you've seen before, but there's also a lot about it which is new, and we have to constantly adapt our techniques to the new problems we face. There's not just one turn the crank method that we can just keep using over and over. All right. That's what's at stake here. Yes? Uh, that statement that you have at the top of the board, I mean, anything we can check, we can find. I mean, that if is, P equals NP. Yeah, if, if P is equal to NP. Yes. I, mean, I know I'm being very, very childish over here, but why is that not a proof that P is not equal to NP? I mean, how could because that could be true. I mean, how could you come up with a more more elegant proof of P not equal to NP than, than that, that very precise statement? I mean, it's... Well, but it's not a proof. I mean, yeah. it's a philosophical position that says, but that's absurd. Well, but that's not a proof. I mean, so the, the funny thing is, right, so a, as you learn the theory of NP completeness, if I told you this first, that is totally obvious, although unproved, that P has to be smaller than NP. But keep in mind that this is the same as some very concrete problems like 3-set, Hamiltonian path, graph coloring. When you look at those particular problems, it's really not so unbelievable that there's a clever trick which eliminates the search. Right? I mean, that's what's fascinating about this. So you start out with Eulerian paths, and you realize, hey, I don't need to search. With Eulerian paths, where I have to cross all the edges exactly, once I just check to see whether all the vertices of even degree or odd degree, oh, that was easy. Well, it's tempting to think that there's a similar trick for Hamiltonian path. All I'm saying is there might be. But if there is, then you can find proofs and do science. and all sorts of other things quickly and depressingly easily. <laughs> um, so for one thing, you could, you, know, you could knock off all of these and collect $7 million. <laughs> but I don't care. Your money's no good here. <laughs> you know. So um, yeah. All right. So anyway. OK, so that's what's at stake. So why can we, can we, can we uh, you know, mount a convincing defense that ingenuity really is required? Can we prove that P and NP are different? And over the past uh, 40 years or so, if you start from when you know, if you start from when the early 70s, when the modern version of NP completeness appeared, um, there have been lots of attempts. Um, but <clears throat> the problem is that uh, there have also been a series of negative results that are kind of meta results that kill off whole classes of potential proofs that P and NP are different. So let me let me start describing one of those. I won't know, don't know if I'll get through this. So one of the ideas is called relativization. Okay. So here's the idea. Um, the idea is that we can define classes 
which I'll write such as p to the a. So what does this mean? This means what you can do in polynomial time with access to an oracle for the, for the problem or function A. Okay. So there are several ways to think about this. So one is that you're writing a, a, a program in your favorite language, Java or something. And I hand you an external function. Okay. This function does something marvelous, which might not actually be in P. But now that I hand it to you, you can call this function anytime you want, just like you would call any other function or subroutine. The question is, well, now what can you do in polynomial time? Presumably, I've souped up your computation abilities somehow. Okay. So for instance, um, suppose that I give you a marvelous external function, which anytime you like will answer the yes or no question of satisfiability. Well, now what can you do in polynomial time? Okay. So, well, for one thing, you can do all of NP. Mm -hmm. Turns out you can actually do a fair amount more, a fair bit more. Don't you have to do three set? Like if you if it hands you two set, it doesn't matter, right? Well, but my external function will handle whichever one you want. Okay. Yeah. But we because three set is complete, we know that that's the same as being able to do three set. Okay. So this is a complexity class. It's actually bigger than NP. Maybe you should try to figure out between now and Thursday why. I mean, I don't know it's bigger than NP. Seems bigger than NP. Um, so try to think of a try to think of a problem which is in this class which we do not believe is in NP. And the great thing is that this external function I give you answers yes or no within a single step. All right. So we say. So let's let's say a proof technique relativizes if um, well if everything it proves it also proves in the presence of any oracle. So for instance, e.g. E um, if it proves that P and NP are different, then it also proves that P to the A and NP to the A are different for any oracle A. Okay, so let me give you an example of a proof technique. Uh, well, or or the or you know the same thing. If if it shows that they're equal, then they're also equal okay. in the presence of this oracle. Here's an example of something which would relativize if it if it existed, which it doesn't. So um, remember that we can think of NP. I, you know, we've focused on the whole witness checking picture of NP or proof checking, and that's the best definition. But you can also think of it in terms of this marvelous non-deterministic computer, where it's your favorite programming language, but with this cool go to both thing added. And what this does is it goes to this point in the program and to that point in the program in parallel, um, and it will answer yes if either of these branches answer yes. Okay? This is like the NFA, right? Remember 2,000 years ago when we were talking about non-deterministic <laughs> finite state automata? It's like that version. The, the program can branch. And the question is, does there exist a path in this branching tree of possible computation paths that leads to the program saying yes? 
All right. Well, let's say that you had a preprocessor so that you have a program written in Java, Java GB, which is Java with GoTo both in it. Let's say you had a preprocessor which would convert a Java GB program to a regular Java program. It just gets rid of the GoTo both things. It just, just by doing some kind of semantic processing, I, I'm sorry, syntactic processing, it just converts these non-deterministic programs to deterministic programs, which, which, which don't take that much longer to run. They still run in polynomial time if the original one did. Well, if such a magical thing existed, then P would equal NP. But the idea is that this thing would relativize because whatever external, function you're, external functions you were calling, well, it could probably just leave those lines of code alone, right? If you have a line in your program which calls this external oracle function, which answers some question that you put to it, well, presumably we don't have to do much to those. Presumably they could pass right through this preprocessor. Okay. Presumably what this preprocessor would work on is, you know, the control flow of the program, and it would convert these go-to boats into some sort of if or, you know, while, I don't know what. But there's no reason to fiddle with the way that the program calls external functions. Right? I mean, we're reasoning about a non-existent object, but hopefully this is halfway convincing. Well, so if there were a proof that P equals NP that worked that way, a kind of very direct translation of non-deterministic programs into deterministic programs, it seems that it would also work in the presence of oracles. So we would say that it relativizes. So another proof technique, which we might hope proves that P and NP are different, is diagonalization. So we'll talk about diagonalization on Thursday. But it seems that this would also relativize. If there's a diagonalization type proof that NP is bigger than P, it seems that it would also work for these oracle versions. Well, here's the bad news. There exists an oracle A such that in the presence of A, P and NP are different. And there exists another oracle in the presence of which P and NP are the same. So sometimes people like to talk about this in terms of possible worlds, right? There's a marvelous science fiction world where there, everybody can go to the store and buy a little box which solves three sat for a penny. In that world, this is what you can do in polynomial time. That's the idea. Well, there are worlds in which we can actually prove that P and NP are different. And there are other worlds in which we can actually prove that they're the same. But this is bad news for any proof technique which relativizes. Because any technique which relativizes comes to the same conclusion in every world. But we know that that just can't be because there are different conclusions in different worlds. So this means that any technique you have for proving that P and NP are the same or that they're different, if it still works in this oracle setting, this where you can call this external function setting, well, there's something wrong with your proof. It's not going to work. It, no such technique can, can resolve the P versus NP question. So this is one of the negative results that's out there. I'll sort of briefly skim another one. And the sad fact is that there's almost no, there are almost no techniques, even on the horizon, that escape these negative meta-theorems. So basically, meta-results like this one, which say, here's a whole set of techniques which will never tell you whether P and NP are the same or different, they kill off basically every technique anyone can think of. And a lot of people believe that of those seven millennium million dollar prize problems, P versus NP is actually the hardest. <laughs> After all, the Poincaré conjecture is about high dimensional spheres. 
the Poincaré, the, the, the Riemann conjecture is about the primes, the Navier-Stokes is about turbulence, but P versus NP is about the fundamental nature of mathematical truth. It's a problem about problems. All right. <laughs> See you Thursday. And hopefully you got my email. I have a PhD defense today, so no office. I'll do some office hours in